Hey, everybody. All right. We'll let everybody get connected. How is everyone settling in online, in person, whatever? You guys excited? Yeah, good. Don't feel shy about turning your camera on. We all look like a hot mess. We don't care what you look like. <laughs> Right, so this is this is uh, totally informal. Um, this is not associated, affiliated with school in any any way. L Lindsay and I kind of do this on our own accord. Um, so uh, everything is run through our Facebook pages. I run Scrubs DES. Lindsay is on Dog Mom DES. So if you're trying to get in touch with us, that's the best way to do it. Um, we weren't sure uh, since a lot of you guys don't don't know us yet, and uh, we didn't know if y'all were familiar with Zoom, but we were pleasantly surprised. We got a good turnout. Um, so feel free to take notes or whatever you want to do, um, but this is recorded, so I will post it later on our pages. And obviously, if there's anything y'all need and y'all need to get in touch with us, Facebook is probably the best way to go about that. So without further ado, my name is Brady Hernandez. I'm the uh, Honor Society president here. I'm a term five. Um, so I'm the Honor Society is IEA, Iota Epsilon Alpha. Um, so if you're looking at that, that's what that refers to. And I'll go ahead and let Lindsay introduce herself. Yeah, so I'm Lindsay. I've been posting on your page for a while now. I am the SGA, president of SOM Affairs. So I specifically deal with all things School of Medicine related. Um, so hopefully you guys went to the org fair yesterday, saw both Brady and myself um, I either in person or online, you saw our organizations, but um, like Brady said, this isn't in conjunction with DES or anything. It's just, we like paying it forward. There were a lot of upper term students that helped us when we were starting out. And we want to do the same for you guys because peer to peer learning and peer to peer support is a huge thing at SGU. I think it's one of my favorite aspects of SGU being able to connect with people and everyone's really ready and willing to help out in um, any way. So that's why Brady are here. Brady and I are here. That's why we're doing this, and that's why we continue to hold reviews and tip sessions um, throughout our time. So, anything y'all need, just reach out on Facebook. And if we don't know the answer, we'll just send you to somebody else who might know. Yeah. So, in regards to the logistics and um, uh, administrative type things, Lindsay would be the person to ask. Um, academically, you can always reach out to me. You just have to ask. So we're definitely here to help. We've been doing this for a while since term two. We started out doing those AEP and PLG sessions through school, but we kind of broke off and now we're able to have these larger sessions and we're able to record our sessions uh, so that people can go back and watch them. So um, again, feel free to just cut us off. You're not going to offend us if you have any questions. We will do a, a, a Q&A at the end. So if you have any sort of things you're curious about, um, and post in the chat too, if you guys have any questions about what we're talking about, don't hesitate to post in the chat. Um, we will try to answer every single question that comes through. Um, it, it, you, like Brady said, you can interrupt us, you, um, but we um, please be respectful of other people trying to get questions answered. We're all here for the exact same reason. Um, so yeah, post it in the chat, we'll get through it. And then Q&A, we'll go through everything. All right, let me share my screen real quick. We try to do this at the beginning of our uh, sessions just to let you guys know. All right, so I run Scrubs, join the page. You can get all my information here. All of the review signups are here. Um, all of the links to our slides, our reviews are there. But look, this is what's important. In the about section, there's a link to the Google Drive. This has a bunch of good stuff that you're gonna wanna look at for sure. Um, to see uh, in regards to term one stuff, you could find it, it's all filed on there. And also important, this term one uh, bookmark for uh, the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is private, you can't search it. Even if you subscribe to it, you won't see the videos. We made them private on purpose. So you need to click this, it will bring you here and you just need to bookmark this page. This has all, this is all of the, um, uh, term one reviews we have. We have different uh, playlists for the term two and term three stuff. So if you want to get a head start, we did an FTM one exam review. This was, I think, from um, either the April or the, the January class. 
So in about three and a half hours, we covered everything that's super important for term one. So if you want to get a head start and just watch the first week's worth and kind of see what, what it's about, um, it certainly can't hurt. You can watch it on 2X or whatever, whatever floats your boat. Whoops, I wasn't supposed to do that. Um, hold on one second. Uh, I was just going to say, um, follow, even though this is not affiliated with um, IEA uh, or our school, you should follow IEA on Instagram, IEA uh, underscore SGU, um, because, <clears throat> well, first off, so after term one, if you get above a 90, you'll be able to apply to the Honor Society. Um, <clears throat> and we offer a lot of tutoring and um and we do a lot of fundraisers and we kind of just help the lower termers kind of uh, fine tune uh, their study schedules. You can kind of see what someone who came before you, how they approach the material. Um, so, but for you guys, for term one, you can, once we get all of the applicants for IEA, we will post a link for tutoring. You can get a one-on-one -on -one session with um, an honor student who could kind of look at what you're doing and try to see if they can help in any way. People really like it. Um, uh, so we've done it for a few years now, but now that we're back on campus, we can do it in person, or if you prefer it over Zoom, we could do that too. So um, also, if you follow IA on Instagram, we post all of um, the um, information regarding the tutoring, but we also do facts of the day. So in regards to like, maybe term ones will be on Monday, they'll, they'll post a fact on Instagram or a question for you guys. And um, it's usually high, high yield material which is a thing that you're gonna hear about a lot, these high yield topics, those are the things that are mostly tested. So follow us on there and um, you, know, you can get all the information. All right, so I think the most important thing is the schedule, right? So um, the number one thing, and it's much easier said than done is to try not to fall behind. Um, uh, the thing is that, and you've probably heard this, that the first week of term one, they throw you into the deep end and they do it on purpose because they want you to start getting into the mindset of, studying 12 hours a day if need be. Um, the thing is, some days are going to be worse than others. Some days you'll have four or five DLAs. Some days you won't have any. But with that being said, let me just um, go through how this is going to work. So you're going to have lectures that are in class. You're going to be taught by the professor classically, kind of like undergrad. But you're also going to get these DLAs, uh, directed learning activities, I think it stands for. Um, so those are also lectures. They should be treated like lectures but you have to learn them on your own, okay? So sometimes there's a video online that correlates to it. You could watch that. But the point is that you should treat the DLAs just like lectures. A, a large portion of the exam is gonna come from these DLAs, okay? So I mean, maybe like 30 or 40%. So you have to do them. Personally, I spend just as much time on a DLA as I would on a lecture, okay? Because it's just as much, you know, the materials uh, just as highly tested. So, um, to keep that in mind. And like I said, that first week you'll have like, sometimes some days you'll have like six DLAs uh, all in one. Um, but put your, put your uh, like, for example, I do the week, my weekly schedule. And so like on Sundays, I'll put my schedule together for the week. And um, like, I'll put the DLAs with the days uh, um, that go with the lectures. So I could see ahead of time, if I have six DLAs I need to do or none or kind of like make it work. But um, I'm going to go through how I actually study and like how I break down my week in a second, but we'll go through the rest of this. So um, another big thing, and they have done uh, statistical analysis on this, and they've proven that uh, in, in regards to your board scores, the, the best board scores or the best correlate to how well you're going to do on the boards is how many practice questions you do. Now, there is it is one aspect to know the material, but you need to understand there's an art to doing these style of questions. It's kind of like playing sports. The more questions you do, the better you get, right? The faster you get, uh, the more confident you get. So it's not just knowing the material, it's knowing how to approach these questions. Now, one of the most difficult things about these multiple choice questions is sometimes there's multiple right answers, but you can only select one. There's no all of the above, there's no A and B or, um, everything except C, nothing like that. It's one single answer. You have to pick the most correct answer. So for example, they can give you a medication regimen and the second and third line drugs may be on there. But if the patient you know, is, is newly diagnosed and you want to start them on the first line medication, that's the correct answer. Even though the other answers may be right, you have to go with the most correct answer. So the only way to really get good at these questions is to practice them. Okay. So one of the big pitfalls that Lindsay and I see is that 
people want to, and it's justifiable, you want to put the practice questions towards the end, right? You want to get through all the material and feel comfortable and then get all the practice questions right. Well, in a perfect world, that would be fine, but it doesn't work like that. Sometimes you have to do practice questions with the assumption that you're going to get it wrong. Okay, but the whole point is when you finish the question, when you read the answers, that you understand it from that point forward. Okay, so sometimes it just doesn't work out. And um, by no means should that mean that you should leave the practice questions off before the exam, especially coming up close to the exam. That should be your focus that weekend prior, you should be doing as much practice questions as possible. So what they actually do, they have interactive multiple choice questions. These are sessions you're going to go to. Uh, they're scheduled in between lectures. You'll see it on your schedule. Um, and you, you, the, the teacher's going to post a question. You're going to click in for it on your phone. Um, and you, I think, believe you need to get 50% of the questions right to get credit. Shouldn't be a problem, um, but uh, it's a learning experience. So um, you need to go into that with that mindset. Understand that the questions they're giving uh, sh should be pertinent to how the questions are going to be on the exam. You can take data from the style of question that that professor is giving, well, if he's asking you about this certain topic that he feels, he or she feels it's important. Okay, so um, I always go back through the IMCQs uh, the day before the exam, just to make sure I have those, those ideas in mind, those topics in mind. Also, y'all are gonna do exam soft quizzes. These are typically on Sunday. You just have to complete it to get credit for it. You don't have to get any of them right. But that means that you should go, at least for me, I go into that with uh, a testing mindset to kind of see where I stand on the week's material. So I don't, use, I don't do open book to answer the questions. Again, you don't have to get them right, you just have to do it. But I treat it like a test. I kind of see where my deficiencies are. Um, it takes like an hour or so um, and they time you and they put it on the testing platform that you use. Okay, exam soft, if y'all aren't familiar with that. Um, but it, 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 the program will shut down your computer and oh, will not shut it down, shut down any extra programs that are running and it'll just time you as you do it. Um, and we'll get into testing practices in a second too. Also, on, yeah, sure, of course. Quick, Brady, yes. Make sure that you understand why the incorrect answers are incorrect. It is just as important to know why you got something wrong as it is why you got something right. So what was um, advised to me is when you're doing these practice questions, don't only look at, you know, the one you got right. You Even if you got it right, you know the concept and everything, you need to go through the answer choices and know why the other ones are wrong. And that is a form of active studying. So make sure that you are going through the answer choices. You are understanding the concepts and you're understanding how they can manipulate the question that they gave you to be able to answer it any way that they could conceive to ask it for you. So don't fall into the trap of, okay, I know this concept because I got this question right. Make sure you really delve into all of the answer choices and you know the differences. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. And I wanna reiterate what Lindsay just said is it's active studying, okay? Like in the, in the beginning, uh, in the beginning of the week, you know, a couple of weeks until the test, passive studying is okay. But when you start getting tired and you're just reading stuff over and over, sometimes it's better to just do active studying. That's the best way of studying. Um, they do the hierarchy. They show you that passive studying, then active studying, and then actually teaching it to someone else is a great way of seeing where your deficits are. That's always the best way of learning, which is beneficial because now you're down here on the island. You could study with other people. Y'all could sit around the table and y'all could just discuss things, right? So. Uh, also, on our drives, we do post other question sets that we've got. SNL is one you'll come across. The IEA Honor Society used to put together questions. So we have question sets on there. Let me tell you, you definitely want to do those prior to the test, okay? Those are very representative of the style of questions you're going to get on the exam. The IEA Honor Society questions are the, the last set of questions I do. So say there's like 130, I'll finish all my lectures, write up all my notes, um, and then when I get, to, then I'll go back through the IMCQs and ESOF quizzes, and then I'll take that 130 questions and I'll go through them and make sure I have everything ironed out before the exam. Okay, so you can find those on our drives. Now, some people, well, I should preface with this, just because it works for me, just because it works for Lindsay doesn't mean it'll work for you guys. Everybody's different. The whole point, the, one of the most important points in med school is learning how you learn, right? So everybody's different. Some people like using Anki. Um, 
I recommend you at least try it. I'm not big on it. Some people live and die by it. Um, Anki is a, um, a flashcard program. Um, it's a little rough around the edges when you get started with it, but people really like it once you get going. Um, it's based on the principle of spaced repetition. So the cards you get right versus the cards you get wrong come back through, they use an algorithm. So um, it's just a way of those strictly memorizing things. But um, that should be um, once, if you do use Anki, that should be one step in the process. But remember, these questions are very, um, very much built around understanding, which is why teaching this material to other people and talking about it is so important because you're not gonna get first order questions. They're not gonna say, this patient comes in with these symptoms, what do they have, right? <laughs> They're gonna say, this patient came in with these symptoms, you gave them some medication, what were the reactions? So you have to go, this patient, these symptoms has this diagnosis, you gave this medication, what are the side effects of that? So it's a third or fourth order question. So if you have any deficits in figuring out those that sequence, um, you're not gonna get the question right. So it is built around understanding. So when the test comes closer, you need to be able to wrap your mind around the whole idea, not just flashcards, uh, not just memorization. Um, but fortunately, as you get started, y'all are starting out in FTM, which is Fundamentals to Medicine. And the way that works is they kind of throw a lot of different topics at you. Y'all will do a little bit of pharmacology, some genetics, some biochemistry. And they're basically, as it states, you know, it's just making a foundation for you. So it's a little uh, combobulated just because it's coming from every direction. Um, but once you get past that, you start getting into the system-based approach. So you do musculoskeletal, you do cardiac, you do respiratory, you do renal, um, and then it gets a little more, more, more consolidated. So for FTM, a lot of, you can use a lot of buzzwords for this. And when we do our reviews, we'll point that out. This is a buzzword for this disease. This is a buzzword for this. If you see a patient that is presenting with this, they probably have this, okay? So they're trying to get you into the idea of, uh, being able to take these buzzwords and put it into a clinical scenario. Now, once you get further on, it's much more conceptual. You have to really kind of uh, dive into the cardiac physiology and figure out the blood flow and stuff. But we'll get to that when you get there. For right now, uh, when you see these buzzwords, we're, we'll point them out for you and um, those will be helpful. Now, lastly here, first aid. First aid, every single person in med school uses it. This is the ride or die. This is the Bible. <laughs> of med school, um, when you're studying for STEP, everybody uses first aid. My advice is the sooner you start looking at it, the better. It is a little bit, um, it, it seems like it's dense because there's not a lot of explanations that go in it, but it's just root memorization uh, or like, there's a lot of tables that tell you exactly what's important. So if you're going through a topic and you're like, I don't know what's high yield, I don't know what's considered important. You can always go to first aid and say like, this is a nice, Little summary, it'll take your entire lecture and sum it up in this little, this little table, right? So it's great. Um, I recommend you start looking at it now. For our reviews, we do incorporate first aid in there just so you can start getting, uh, getting a peek at it. So definitely make sure you get it. Uh, you can find the PDF somewhere, but most of us have a hard copy just because um, it's that important. All right. I want to yeah, cut in real quick and just add on to what Brady said. Um, I posted it in our chat, but make sure that you are also adaptable in your in your learning style. Like Brady said, what works for him, what works for me might not work for you. Um, make sure that you figure out how you learn best, but also make sure that if something isn't working, you change it up. Don't live and die on the altar of what you've done before because it might not work now adapt how you did it, adapt from F, you know, FTM to MSK to CPR. It'll be a little different. DES does have learning strategists for you. So you can talk through how you study, talk through how you're doing your issues and they can give you suggestions. So don't hesitate to reach out to DES and find those people who can help you because sometimes you have to switch it up from one module to the next, or sometimes you know, you've been studying for a few days and it's not sticking. You don't know what's going on. Don't hesitate to reach out to DES. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. There is a learning curve here. So just understand that. And with the first aid, they have a lot of great mnemonics, a lot of great like memory shortcuts. Don't hesitate to use those mnemonics and memory shortcuts. Sometimes I come up with something like simple and like cutesy and dumb, but I've never forgotten it. So don't hesitate to do that for yourself as well. 
All right, what I was gonna do is kind of, my internet's slow, so this is all um, delayed. Welcome to Grenada, the internet's not the best down here off campus. Anyway, so I'll just talk you through it, My how I run my study schedule. And again, everybody's different. This is just what works for me, but I get a lot of questions about it, so I'll run it through with you guys. My first rule is by Monday of the following week, everything from the previous week is done. Okay, I don't like stuff to carry over. I find it stressful. So my goal is that Monday of the next week, everything from the previous week is done. Now, um, some people like studying on a 24 hour cycle, meaning if you have lecture on Monday, after lecture, you go home and you study Monday's material. I like a 48 hour cycle, right? So um, for two reasons. One, if I've, if I've thought about it in lecture a lot, I kind of don't want to think about it, you know, the same exact drugs or the same exact topic that afternoon. So I do things on a 48 hour cycle. They also say that long-term memory is formed when you sleep. So I kind of like to sleep on the lectures, come back the next day and do those. What this means is if I have lectures on Monday, I'll study Monday's lectures on Tuesday. So Tuesday on Wednesday, all the way through the week, which means Friday's lectures I do on Saturday. Okay, Sunday is completely dedicated to doing questions. And if there's any like rollover material I need to work with. Um, now you need to keep in mind that intermixed in there, sometimes I have to worry about small groups and stuff like that. That's just how the schedule works out. If there are DLAs integrated, those get put in there too. I don't push anything to the next day unless it's like, you know, unless it's, um, unless it's a lot or, so, or something comes up, right? So I try to do it on a 48 hour cycle. Um, and I like to give a full day to do questions or have any rollover stuff that I like something that was really difficult. I need to look at again, which means Monday. So then since I do Monday's lectures on Tuesday, Monday is not not necessarily an off day. But if I need to prep anything for for reviews for the lower terms, I could do that on Monday as well. So you could see that. Um, the point of making sure that nothing rolls over to the next week is because there's no extra time at the end. Right. You y'all you guys will have an exam every three weeks and you'll have lectures up until the Friday and then you'll have the weekend and then you'll have the test on Monday. So you can't be like four days behind because there's no time to catch up and understand they test the, the lectures um, for the most part are all tested equally. So the same amount of questions will come from the lectures right before the exam as the ones you got for, you know, right in the beginning. Okay, so each lecture, each DLA needs to be treated, you know, given the same amount of effort. So whatever works for you, if you want to start out, I did start out doing it 24 hours just because it worked out, but I kind of migrated into this 48 hour system. Um, but whatever works for you, but the, the idea is that um, you go into the week with the schedule, right? You need to kind of um, lay it all out and know what, uh, what you want to do. All right, so I, when I take tests, um, I am very systematic. Every test I take is exactly the same. I find by doing this, I try to eliminate the stress, right? So every single test I take is exactly the same. I go through the first time through the test, I answer all the questions. I flag any questions I'm not sure with. So, um, so first off, definitely watch the clock because uh, you don't want to you know, run out of time. You have 72 seconds per question. That seems like a lot, but some questions are, they just take a little bit longer. Um, but again, by doing more practice questions, you do get faster by the time you're turn four, turn five. I mean, we all take tests fairly fast at this point, but in the beginning, you have to read through things over and over. And um, so watching the clock is super important. You need to have check marks to make sure you're at a certain number at a certain time frame um, to make sure uh, you, know, you don't run out of time at the end. The highlight function, I like it. And when you y'all use exam solve, y'all should play around with it. The reason I like that is because it does actually make me slow down. Like I can actually, I'll, sometimes I'll read a question quickly and I'll get to the end and I'll be like, I don't even remember what I was reading. Like, so by highlighting things, you can highlight those buzzwords and it'll help you slow down and kind of piece together the situation. Also, when you go back through to check the test, if it's already highlighted, you, can, you don't have to read the whole question. You could be like, oh, this was about that. Yeah, that's the right answer. Also, the strikeout function is super important because there is something psychologically about you, you physically striking out, you know, answers C, D, and E, and seeing that it's only A and B are your options. Because, you know, sometimes they'll give you questions that are just up and down arrows, you know, like for different parameters. And you can go through and be like, well, this one's wrong, strike that out. This one's wrong in this row, strike it out. So it makes it systematic, okay? The whole goal is to take a test 
with your frontal lobe, right? You don't want any emotional memories or emotional, uh, you know, confoundment going through. You want to be able to think in your higher order where you studied from, your, you know, your frontal lobe so that you can, uh, you know, um, try to leave the emotions uh, far away. Now, when I do take the first, the first pass through the exam, I do mark it with the best answer, I think, but if I'm not positive, I'll flag it. Um, and then when I go back through, the, after I've answered every question and I go back through the second time, I just go through the flag ones. Now, you, you guys are probably like me. I've taken um, tests where they check your, um, the data and it, I, they found, the data has found that more often than not, if I do change an answer, I change it from right to wrong, which means my first answer is typically correct. So I have a rule now that, and again, this has to do with stress and you wanna keep it out. I have a rule that when I go back through the flag ones, unless I'm defin definitively made a mistake, um, I leave it, right? And I'll, I'll unflag it. So that second pass through, I'm just going through the flag ones, I check it. Um, I say, okay, I'm either gonna leave it or you know, I made a, a mistake, let me change it. Okay, so now I've gone through all the flags. Now the last pass, I go through every answer very quickly and just make sure I marked everything and there are no mistakes. So it's a very systematic approach to it. Um, again, it keeps the emotions out of it um, and it, you know, it, it's worked for me. So um, that's my advice for you guys. When you do practice questions, try to keep them 72 seconds or even a minute. A minute's a good threshold because if you can keep it to a minute, then you have time to go back and check it. Okay. so. Um, Get used to that, Lindsay. I do the exact same thing as Brady, nothing different. Um, the only thing I want to add to what he just said, I try to have at least 18 to 20 minutes after my first pass. Sometimes it gets down to 15 or 10 if it's a more difficult section. And so don't beat yourself up if you get to the end. In term one, you might actually have less. But I like to have at least 15 ish minutes after I've gone through my first pass to go through my second pass through my flagged questions. And then hopefully I'll have um, about four to five minutes to do my last pass where I'm just going through and making sure everything I've clicked, I've clicked correctly. And I never, ever, ever on my last pass change anything. Don't change it on your last pass. That is only to make sure that from question one to 48, Everything you click is what you wanted to click, but everything Brady said, I'm going to reiterate, that's exactly how I do it. And what's interesting, and y'all learn in neuro, is that when you're studying and you're thinking in higher order thought, you, you, you think with your frontal lobe. Emotional memories are formed very differently, which is why when you're stressed out, you tend to forget things, right? So the whole goal here is to be a robot. Robots don't have emotion to my understanding, and that's your goal. You're only thinking with the front part of your brain, okay? So if you're systematic about it, I promise you that'll help. Because if it, yeah, everyone knows test anxiety is a real thing, um, it'll get easier, I promise, but um, that should be your whole goal. Now, because we are online right now, there's, for logistical reasons about the people back home, um, for you guys that are back home, um, no, there are no whiteboards. When Lindsay and I were here in the beginning, when everybody was on campus, we had whiteboards. Take it or leave it. Um, you could say it's harder without the whiteboard, but they actually, I, I, I don't think it's that bad because they really can't give you complex math questions. They can't give you genetic pedigrees uh, to work out because you don't have a whiteboard. Irrespective of the situation, the point is there is no whiteboard. There is a little note section on the side of the uh, testing software you can use to write notes up. You know, um, but just keep in mind that the teachers are aware that you don't have a whiteboard. So if there's any math, it's going to be fairly straightforward. OK, so keep that in mind. Um, and then lastly, so you're going to check your answers, whatever works for you. Um, try it our way. If you like that, then go for it. But again, you're probably like us. Um, you probably for some reason, even if you're not positive about it, uh, you, you genuinely know more than you realize. And in a testing situation, it may not seem that way. So that first answer is usually what you want to go yeah. with. And honestly, if you're not 100% sure, you're, it's kind of a toss up anyway. So don't emotionally put yourself through a tough question like that, because, you know, I, I some questions, I just have to take the L and go with my gut, because if I sit there for another minute or so, it's not going to change anything. 
Um, so just trust your gut. You are smarter than you realize. You have absorbed more information than you realize. Really, like it, it's stressful sometimes, but you really do need to listen to Brady. Trust your gut there. <laughs> Always listen to Brady. Okay. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Y'all, y'all, yeah. Anyway, but um, when we do our actual reviews, when we start getting into the material, um, we're going to point things out about like little tricks and tips because again, you're, the only game you're playing is this multiple choice game, right? You'll do uh, clinical interactions later, but for right now, this is a simple multiple choice test. There's no essays, there's no fill in the blanks. You are learning to be able to take this test, this style of test the, the best way you can. So we'll run through a lot of tips and tricks. Um, you know, as we actually get into the material, it'll get easier. So things you need to watch out for. Exceptions are huge. Unfortunately, nothing in medicine is really black and white. We like to think so, but they're always little exceptions. So if you're looking at two different disease patterns, right, and everything's the same except, you know, one little parameter, that's probably what they're going to test you on. So you want to highlight stuff um, and, and look at stuff in bold or however you take notes. Um, you want to highlight that to make sure you understand, like, this is something that makes them different. Or they'll talk about four diseases that, that all show with this, and then this one disease is actually flipped or different proteins that flip in different. The point is, if, there any, if there's any exceptions, um, that's what you want to focus on. Obviously, what professors emphasize in lecture, which is the good thing about it, um, the, the teachers, they go into the lectures knowing the, 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 que the test questions. So sometimes you'll find, they'll, you'll find that they're just spending more time on a slide than you would expect just star that slide or they'll, you know, like Dr. Mpadia who teaches biochemistry, she'll just straight up tell you, she's like, you just need to know this slide, right? So you just need to star it because um, obviously there's, um, you know, there's probably a question about it. Probably the most important thing because you're trying to be a doctor is the clinically relevant stuff. So if you were to ask me, what's the most high yield stuff in a lecture, I would say go straight to the diseases, right? Go straight to the clinically relevant stuff. Um, a good trick is to, if, well, what ends up happening is you have to start out with a little story before you get to the disease, right? You have to know what happens, the proteins change, they're, you know, misfolded or whatever when they get to the, to the membrane or whatnot. And then you get to the, the disease at the end. But a good trick when you're studying is to take the disease and then work backwards. Say, okay, this is cystic fibrosis. This patient presents with pulmonary and digestive problems and reproductive problems. Why is that? There's mucus built up. Why is that? Because the chloride channels are flipped. Why is that? Because there's a, you know, there's a CFTR mutation in the gene. So I just work backwards through the whole process. And that way, uh, when it comes down to the second, third, fourth order questions that come up, um, you, can, you can answer each one of them. And then you could even go back in and say, well, what, would, what kind of medications would you get for this? What kind of, kind of long-term treatments you get? What are the long-term consequences of having this disease? When do they present? So these are the type of things that you're going to get used to. But again, if you're asking yourself questions, ask them in a clinically relevant way. Again, I want to reiterate, first aid is great at this. They'll take the disease and they'll just say, bare bones, this is what you need to know about it, okay? It's not going to give you a big fluffy story like some of the, the lectures will, but it'll tell you directly what you need to know. All right. Yep. So again, kind of pointed this out, disease concepts, very similar. How do you differentiate them? That's what they're going to ask um, on the test. And remember, the, the teachers write these questions on Sakai. So if they feel it's an important question, there's probably something similar uh, on the exam. Again, like Lindsay said, uh, make sure you know why the other answers are incorrect because they could write the same question and just, you know, um, ask it about it, one of the uh, uh, incorrect question, um, answers in the, in the previous um, question. All right, so how to uh, approach questions. So yeah, there's no real right way to do it. Um, some people, so th these are large vignettes, right? Every question is going to be a blah, blah, blah. You're a patient comes in with blah, 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 blah. What do you do type stuff? There's no right way to do it. Some people like to read the last sentence, which is just the question. Uh, basically, um, sometimes even, especially in the beginning, uh, a lot of the, the information at, in the front of the question uh, or in the front of the vignette is not really relevant. And then they'll just ask you a simple question at the end. Um, so some people like to do that. Uh, some people like to read the answers and kind of see what they're going into the question with. Personally, I just read the question from the beginning. I pretend the patient's walking into my office and I'm like, all right, well, um, 
you know, I just want to kind of get the story and then I could do it. I don't know. I think uh, going about it that way, like reading it from the beginning will help you long term. But if you're trying to get used to it, you can try whichever way uh, you do it. What about you, Lindsay? How do you go about it? I'm sorry, repeat it. I was answering questions. No, in the so chat. so do you do you read the question from the beginning or do you know how some people will read the last yeah. read the sentence at the end or read the answers? So I'm gonna be transparent here. In term one, I read word for word very um meticulously and because I wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything, which is important because sometimes one or two words do change what they want from you. Um, but when they're talking about symptoms and, and vital signs and everything, I tend to skim that first and then read the question intently. And if I think I need to go back through what I just skimmed, I will. But when I skim, I do highlight, like Brady said, it's really good to train your brain to the highlight higher points. And also if you flag it, you go back, you can just hone in on that. But, um, lately I skim it look at the question and then go back if I need to really look at something. So I think the bottom line is you just need to figure out what works for you. Um, but again, it just takes practice, right? Uh, and it should be noted it when you're stressed or when you're doing things quickly, it's very easy to skip over words like not or accept. Um, so make sure you highlight those because obviously that changes the answer. Okay, so just practice try it out. If you can go from beginning to end, uh, I, I think it'll help you when it comes to the board exams because uh, each word is more relevant as you go along. But just try it out. You'll see how you like it. Uh, oh, never mind. That's for my other group. Um, okay, so this is access to the Google Drive, but you have the link there if you need it. Um, that's really all we wanted to talk about academically, uh, but we can go ahead and answer any questions for you guys um that y'all had specifically uh, it might be the best um and more organized raise your hand if you guys know how to raise your hand in the in the um reactions and we'll call on people so that we make sure everyone gets their question answered and nobody is talking over anybody and if i butcher your name i sincerely apologize you're not going to offend me if you correct me okay so Oh man, I like trying to pronounce your names correctly. Muhil, Mu, Muhil Dane. Oh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Tell me how to pronounce your name. Muhidin. Okay. Yeah, the L is silent, but I don't blame you. I understand. Okay. I like to make um, sure you say it correctly to respect you. No, you're done. You're good. You're good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, you guys, for doing this. First of all, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, I just have a question regarding the DLAs because I heard that, well, the professor told us that the DLAs will not be covered in class. Correct. Um, so I was so the, those are things that we study on our own. So I was wondering, how do you guys like? Because like, so the first DLA that we got was about the cell membranes and whatnot. And there are objectives and then there are like few slides, but the slides don't necessarily answer all of the objectives. So did you, how did you guys study the DLAs? You know, and, and there was also assigned, assigned readings. So I was wondering how you guys went through the DLAs. Did you just answer the objectives or did you go over the slides or whatnot? Okay, I, I'll, okay. I don't go answer ahead, objectives. I don't I either. Have, I, don't I even have look at them. heard, no, I don't look at them either. I have heard so many people that started to off in term one, trying to answer the objectives. And they said it took so long. Don't try to do that. Don't focus on the assigned readings. Do them if you want to gain a better understanding. The testable material is all in your lectures. It's nowhere else, just in your lecture slides. It's not even in small groups. So when you're talking about FTM one content exam, you're just looking at the lectures for FTM. Um, yeah, does that so, answer? Here's the thing. Um, I, I don't even look at the objectives. I just go from the first actual taught slide through the end. The thing about it, for the most part, those objectives are just saying what the notes are about and it, Anything additional in the notes is supplemental to the to the actual objectives that are being answered. So if you just go through, at least it'll kind of give you a storyline uh, through the notes. You don't actually, um, you know, really need to do the objectives. They're just kind of outlining what um, 
what uh, you know the, the lecture is going to be about. But that's actually an administrative thing. They they use the objectives to actually write the questions and like they have to tag the little number code on there and stuff. But um, for the most part, uh, everybody just kind of um, goes straight through the notes. Also, the additional readings. Um, more power to you if you can get to them. But uh, again, like Lindsay There's said- There's not time. There, yeah, There's no, no um, th it'll be like, read this chapter and it's like 50 pages. And it's just like, I don't know. Um, so yeah, the, everything you need to know is in the lecture. So um, uh, that's probably the best approach. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ashika? Ashika. Ashika. Hi, um, so I pulled up the Google Docs that was posted on the Facebook page. And just like I asked previously that you mentioned that the first aid book is really helpful, but where in the Google Docs should I go to find like where in first aid I would be helpful for a certain concept? They have chapters that yeah. I follow. It's easier once you get into the systems, like when you start talking yeah. about, you know, cardiac, yeah. it'll have a cardiac chapter for right now. If you're using the PDF, you could just search it, which is probably the best way to go about it. But when y'all are doing the biochemistry lectures, you'll find it in the biochem chapter. That's probably the most aggravating thing or cumbersome thing about first aid right now is where to find it. What yeah. I actually do, uh, if you look on my Google Drive, um, I actually pull out certain pages for certain topics and post them independently. So if I find a good pathway, I'll just post that and tag it for that. Um, the audio cut out. Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I'll I'll post just a couple of, of slides together. Um, let me just sh share. I'll show you guys um, a couple of things on my drive real quick. I need to actually add you guys to it, but if you look at the previous term one stuff. Um, uh, you could see. Okay, so term one. Um, yeah, so I'll add y'all, but all of these will be the same. So um, additional resources where you want to go. So y'all are FTM one. So this is actually what I do. People really like this. So I when when I go through lecture, I highlight I have I use yellow, um, um, green and red and red being most important in the lectures. So it's very systematic, uh, the way I highlight. And then closer to the exam, what I do is I write these con consolidated or condensed notes. Um, this is like bare bones, um, like, you know, just strict memorization of what I go through. Some people will print this stuff off. I'll, I'll add charts sometimes to it, but, um, and some good mnemonics. Um, but y'all are welcome. I just post these in case people uh, want to go through and look to see what I felt was important. But some of these are good mnemonics, some of these kind of just to find things. This is just something that I want to go through that I could like rapidly go through a couple times before the exam. So I, I do this for every test. Uh, they're all posted for you guys. Then I also post um, like any drug list or diseases or anything uh, that I came across that uh, I felt was super important. So y'all will get to the genetic testing. This is kind of bare bones, how all the genetic testing stuff works. So anything you find on there that, um, that you like, uh, you're more than welcome to use. But once we get to cardio and stuff, um, you can see my notes, you know, they get a bit more dense, right? So, um, but again, this is like just bare bones memorization type stuff. So y'all are welcome to use this printed out or whatever, everything's there. Um, so yeah. Okay, Nikki. Hi, uh, thank you guys for doing this. It's really, really helpful. Um, my question is, I was wondering if you guys can talk a little bit more to uh, your study schedules because I'm finding that, okay, there's lecture two hours a day and then there's small group and sometimes the IMCQ sessions and then I'm an AP, so I have that as well. And then I hear about these OPLG review sessions and then your review sessions. So I'm just wondering how you guys like incorporate all of those things because they're helpful. And then like when you do your DLAs and you know, all like, how do you fit everything in? I live and die by my Google calendar. Brady sets his calendar up a week and ahead. I set my calendar up a term ahead. So as soon as the schedule is posted on the registrar site and it's official, I put everything academic into my Google calendar. 
And then I am very intentional about updating it with anything and absolutely everything. Like if you saw my Google calendar, it would be a little bit overwhelming, but if it's not on my Google calendar, it doesn't happen. But the, it also allows me to pull it up, look at it and kind of plan my week mentally. So if I know that I'm caught up on something like, okay, I can spend the rest of the day reviewing or, oh, hey, I'm a little behind. So I need to spend this much time doing this. So I try to stay on top of everything and get everything done in one day that I can. Brady said he does a 48 hour cycle where, you know, the material on Monday he stays on Tuesday. I actually do it the same day whereas everything for monday i do on monday everything for tuesday i do on tuesday and then spend the weekend catching up and reviewing to make sure that i understood everything there um and so in term one i will say your scheduled time is a lot less than it will be in year two once you hit term three and term four um, you have many more required sessions that you have to attend. So take advantage of year one, so term one and term two, in that you only have one or two small groups per week. You only have a couple IMCQ sessions per week. You'll have one lab per um you know, system and everything like that, but whatever calendar, it doesn't have to be Google, whatever you like. Um I would schedule in everything on that. If you get involved, put everything in there. And so I do it day by day. Brady does the 48 hour cycle, but um, just make sure that you are organized. Organization is the number one thing that I personally recommend to students. And look, it, we've all like, well, now we have small group every day. So it's just, we don't even care anymore. It's just, we, there's no complaining. I'm gonna just let you know, some days are just gonna suck. Some days you're gonna have small group. You're gonna have to meet somebody at lunch. You're gonna have to do this. Uh, and you're just gonna have no time. It doesn't matter. Then you have to stay up late or whatever and just get it done because there's no time to roll over. Um, so just granted, just take, take it on the chin. Uh, you know, some days are just gonna be worse than others, yeah. right? Some days it's going to be dust till dawn. Some days you're going to have time to go out to eat or hang out at night. It's just, it is what it is, honestly. <laughs> I think the best thing you could do is just try to be efficient. Like um, you'd be surprised how much time, like walking to the study hall or like going home and making food, like figure all that out so you can do it quickly, right? So you can make sure that you're getting done what you need to get done. Because the worst case scenario is that uh, you're like two days out from the test and you got, you're like a week behind. You're like, that's not an option. Okay. So like, you just need to make sure that whatever it takes, you get it done. Um, explain to your families. Look, we've all, we all have fam my family's not. Yeah. Look, my family's not, I mean, my mom's a nurse, but they're not doctors. Right. So like me explaining to them, my study schedule and how it works, they don't get it. Your family probably won't get it either. When you tell them you study all day, they'd be like, that's great. Like make time for us. It doesn't work like that. They need to, everybody needs to understand like, uh, whatever it takes, um, you need to let them know that, um, you know, it's, it's a time, time consuming. Okay. So now, <laughs> I will say this, your mental health is very important. If you feel like you need a mental health day, you take a mental health day because the worst thing that you can do is not realizing you're getting burnt out and you get burned out. Like there are so many resources on campus, reach out to the PSC, reach out to upper term students, like make those connections. If you need a mental health day, please take a mental health day because going, going every, all day, every day, it, it, it will wear you down. So if you wake up one morning and you just find that you have no motivation, don't guilt yourself. We all do it. I'm one of those people, like sometimes if I'm not studying, I feel guilty and it, it happens to all medical students. Just accept it. Know that's a feeling you're going to have and move on. But if you wake up one day, you feel unmotivated. You don't feel like you can study. Don't go to the beach, lay around, watch Netflix, because 
Um, the last thing you want to do is hurt yourself. Yes, you may have to play catch up the next day and it might be harder the next day, but you need to get that motivation back. You need to rest. You need to take care of yourself. Medical students are notorious for not taking care of ourselves. I'll forget to eat all day long because I'm just study, study, studying. And I'll like my stomach will hurt at like five o'clock in the afternoon and I'll realize, oh, Lindsay, you haven't eaten a single thing all day or in the last six hours. So pay attention to your, you know, body clock, what you need to do for yourself, like take a shower, like pamper yourself for an hour. Um, just your mental health is very important. So I want to interject that in there. But after Lindsay, you can pampered, I also jump in. <laughs> after you pampered, go study. Yes. Keisha, what's up? <laughs> um, I think I think you guys one you'll realize like FTM and FTM one and two that it, there's a lot of trial and error, right? I, also, my name is Keisha. I'm an upper termer like Brady and Lindsay. Um, Cassie's also there. She's uh, I don't know where I'm pointing, but she's also an upper termer. So we can answer any questions that you guys have too. Um, you will realize right off the bat that there is going to be a lot of trial and error with FTM. You, it's it's going to be a big learning curve and it's not a bad thing. You're going to figure out what works and what doesn't work and, it, and not just based off of your exam scores, but also on how you do your quizzes, so on and so forth. And for like OPLG and attending those AEP, make sure you schedule that in because they take the material that you've spent hours upon hours studying and help you get very targeted and make it more digestible than anything you go through. Myself included was in AEP as well as Cassidy. Um, we did great. We, we did awesome because of the fact those sessions were so helpful. And then we would attend review sessions that were held by Brady and Lindsay. So there are great opportunities to further consolidate and ensure that the material is much more understandable because often there's so much noise in med school with the lecture slides and so many things and you just will feel overwhelmed and like Brady said it's going to be a rough day sometimes other days it's going to be much better and when you go through these review sessions especially when you feel a little wobbly on the material they can help clarify what you essentially need to know versus what you is just a lot of background noise. Yeah, for sure. And I'm giving you guys a hard time because you do need to hear it. But we all actually, we all have Netflix. We all make time to go to dinner with friends. Like, it's yeah. not that big of a deal. Like, you'll, yeah. you, you will be fine. But as Keisha was saying, like, you can learn a whole lot from people that have come before you. You know, like, yeah. you can spend and four hours on something and we could, like, we're like, mm, nope, nope, don't need to know that. <laughs> so the just, resources yeah, are there. Mind. Yeah. The resources are there. SGU has a lot to offer their students. DES has a breadth of resources in AEP and PLGs. It, you know, in learning strategists and tutors, you know, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -to -peer tutoring, tutoring that happens. There are resources there as long as you're willing to meet us halfway and ask for them. So it, if sometimes I would be... Um, doing a lecture and I just could not for the life of me figure out what I needed to know. I, I like whether it was a, like, sometimes I was just tired. Sometimes I was just hitting a wall and I would text my tutor who was my old AEP advisor. And I said, Hey, I'm just not getting this lecture. I don't know what's expected of me. Can we hop on zoom for a second and you can just walk me through. And she would do that and it would help so much. So like, don't hesitate to use the SGU resources. They are there for you. Use us, use other upper termers. Like if we're not your favorite, we're not going to be hurt about it. Like you go, you find whoever you mesh with, whoever you um, click with and who like helps you the most. The biggest thing is just you finding that resource and you finding those people that can help you through. Facebook. Um, Best yeah, way to reach Face, Facebook. Facebook's the easiest way to do it. Um, and look, uh, our our FTM one or email report, Facebook. <laughs> <Don't>, <laughs> okay, Brady doesn't want to be emailed. Don't I email you can email me. <laughs> Slide in my DMs. Just kidding. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, our FTM one recording from just a couple months ago for you guys in for the term before you is posted. 
So if you want to take a look at the stuff beforehand, I would highly recommend it. You could kind of, cause I'm telling you that it comes really fast that first week. And um, yeah, so you can go take a look at it. You have the link to it. It's uh, doable though. Yeah, we've Guys, all done it's it. It's doable. Like you look at that and it's intimidating. It is doable and you can do it. We promise you. Um, the best way that I like to go through information is chunking. Um, they talk about this in one of the DES um, workshops that they do. And at the time I didn't really understand it or like appreciate it, but now it's like, oh my goodness, this helps me so much. So what chunking is you are pairing like with like. So in FTM, the biggest thing is gonna be chunking entire lectures. So you'll notice that lectures like one and two and the accompanying DLAs are very similar in topic to one another. I don't take those as lecture one, lecture two, lecture three. I chunk all of it together and I'm like, this is a concept. And I learn that particular concept. And so that helps at least in my mind, not be overwhelmed by the number of lectures and number of slides because you're putting everything together. You're learning the concept as a concept. I don't learn each individual slide. I don't go slide one, slide two, slide three. I go, okay, these five slides are this one concept. I chunk them together. I look at the five slides as a whole. I go through it and I reword it or chart it. Or I love whiteboarding. You'll hear me talk about it a lot. Brady's not a whiteboarder. That's perfectly fine. Again, whatever works for you is what is the best strategy for you, but I'll take those five slides. I'll whiteboard it out in the way that it makes sense to me. If I feel like I need additional information, I'll go to my supplemental resources. Honestly, um, don't try to do supplemental resources for every single thing. There's not enough time. There's honestly not enough time, but if you feel like you need it, go find your resources. Um, and then I have, you know, I've chunked it together. I've condensed it. And that helps me. Um, so that's how I study that material and don't get overwhelmed with the amount or the number of lectures. And it, in that regard, it's a good point in that FTM one, like you'll get, you'll have like one farm lecture, one biochem lecture, one genetics lecture, then another farm lecture. Like the idea of chunking, maybe not, not even if you need to do it like slide by slide, but take all the farm lectures together. Yeah. Like this is how we teach it. When I, when we do our reviews and stuff, we'll do all the farm stuff together and then all the genetic stuff together. So like you could take them and, you know, they don't have to be chronological. Okay. Because again, like once you get into systems based, maybe it's better that way, but right now you can put all the topics together so that you can kind of compartmentalize them in your head it'll make it easier. Yeah. And it also helps because the lectures kind of popcorn around. And so if you have three lectures on one topic and they split it up, they're not going to do it one after the other. They'll do it like, okay, the first lecture on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday is this topic. And then the second lecture is a different topic. And so I, um, I have to be like hyper organized or it messes with me. So I'm actually one of those people that prints my lectures off. Um, and I chunk it together in how I like to organize it. If you like notability or one note, you can do it the exact same way. You can put lectures like, like with like, remember chunking. If you have, you know, cellular organization one and cellular organization two, I don't do it lecture one, lecture two. I do it cellular organization. It's one concept, chunk it together. That's how I do it. That's how I organize it. And because FTM is all over the place, because is it is a lot of foundational concepts that are chunked together. It's very important that you do organize it in the best way that makes sense to you. All of this information is important. It does come back. It, they continually fold it back into the curriculum, which is something that I really like and respect about SGU that they'll give you something, but they're, it, they're not expecting you to learn it and master it in that one small amount of time. They're constantly gonna fold it back into the curriculum and apply it in multiple different ways. So by the time you get to the point where you are studying for a step you've learned it in so many aspects that it's a well-rounded fully developed concept at that point in time all right there's a good question in the chat let's talk about small groups real quick okay so the first small group y'all go to get everybody's phone number and y'all make a group chat all right let's say you got five people in your small group and the, you have to the next small group you have to present 10 slides 
You should dedicate two slides to eat per each person. Y'all should make a Google Doc or whatever. Have everybody, you have to have it done the day prior. Y'all compile it together. Now, that doesn't mean just know your two slides. It's just you took the time to make sure those slides are highlighted or annotated or whatever. Okay. You need so to be able I, to present everyone. Yeah. So then once everything's compiled, compiled, you can look through the other stuff. This is the reason you could spend four or five, six hours doing a small group. Um, and a lot of that stuff isn't necessarily tested. It's supplemental. Okay. So you don't want to have to spend six hours doing a small group that's mandatory um, when you could have spent six hours, you know, going through lectures and stuff. So the best way to do it is talk to your group and split it up, make sure y'all do it together. But yes, as Lindsay said, you do need to, because ideally some, some facilitators will be like, all right, who wants to present the first two slides? And you'll be like, well, I did those, let me do those, right? But some facilitators will be like, I'm gonna call on you randomly. So um, you have to be ready to present anything. Um, so yeah, but make sure you um, uh, are very cognizant of the time when you do the small groups, because by all means, those lectures and practice questions are much more important. All right, who's next? Lindsay, butcher somebody's oh, name, please. Sorry. <laughs> Rabab? Hi. We can't hear you. You're muted. Yeah, hi, how are you? Good. Um, thank you guys for having the session. Uh, it's been really helpful. I just had a quick question, um, and I know it was kind of covered briefly, but so we go over the slides, we go over the INCQs, all of the questions that are provided. And then like during the time that we're studying, we realize like, okay, this concept does not make sense or I really don't understand it. Then you, then you seek out supplemental resources. What are those supplemental resources and how do you go about studying? It's a two part question, sorry. So that's the first question. And then the second part is, um, there's a, another term, I think she's a second term student, term two student. She told me that she felt that the INCQs and the questions that were given were not very helpful when taking exams. Like they weren't bo very board style questions, if that makes sense. Um, do you guys have any comments as to, like, as to that? <laughs> I'll let Lindsay talk. Lindsay's good with the supplemental stuff. I usually stick to the lectures. Um, and if I need to go, I'll just go on the internet and search stuff if I need to. Um, but Lindsay could talk about that. But in regards to the IMCQs, like, just, I promise, like, just do them. Um, okay. you should try them. Yes. Uh, so in the first term, first two terms, they're, they're, they are trying to teach you. They get more clinically based later on. But I think they are representative. Yeah, they are. You, yeah. you, you know, that you could at least gauge where you're at with the material. Yeah, I appreciate agree. that. I, okay. I don't know who told you that exactly, but I I've legit yeah, had no. times when questions that were similarly worded for FTM show up on the actual test, like during the IMCQs. Those question stems they might not be exact one to one, but they are phrased very similarly. And it puts you in the right mindset as to how to approach those questions, even though they might not be one to one. Sometimes they do tend to be one to one. And I'm like, oh, OK, I remember doing this IMCQ or the Sakai question and I can go ahead and answer it like pretty straightforward. Um, okay. Lindsay, do you want to do the external resources? I have a, yeah. I have a whole bunch of thoughts on that, but like, that's yeah. all you. Um, so in year one, I would stick to more osmosis, physio, lecturio, those kind of more lecture style resources. Um, the reason being, um, don't Wait, Lindsay, invest. Lindsay, Lindsay, say that slower so they could write it down. I don't know if they're familiar okay, with these. Sorry. Osmosis is short animated videos. Physio and lecturio are more lecture style. Um, so physio is P H Y S. E O Lecturio is L E C T U R I O. Those are different resources, but they're both more lecture style, like PowerPoint lecture style. Um, get free trials. Remember, not everybody is going to like all resources. Please get your free trials. See which ones you like, um, because it is um, it is a lot of money. Um, sometimes you can find really good discounts. Um, for year one, I would not recommend AMBOSS, USMLE, um, RX, 
U World, all of those question banks are fantastic in year two. You don't learn enough to be able to use these resources in, in year one. If you want to do it, more power to you. There's no one saying you can't do it. I'm just saying that there are a lot of money. And if you want to, um, so I would recommend you waiting until year two. So at the beginning of year three, you can invest in those resources. In term five, you actually get UWorld and USMLE RX. So don't spend your own money on that. You will get it in term five. Um, Sketchy, I would recommend, and Pathoma, I would recommend for term three. So again, not year one. There might be a few things in year one that Sketchy is good for, but I think the money you're going to spend is not worth it for year one, just because it's 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 not going to help you as much. But for you, for term three onward, yes, Sketchy, Pathoma, if you want to invest in those, I um, that's a really good one. Again, remember, take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Um, you, of course, need to make your own decisions at the end of the day. I'm just trying to provide you more information so that you can make your own decision based on what you need academically. Um, but that's what I recommend, how I use them. Like I said, I primarily use the SGU lectures because all the testable information is in those lectures. When I use a supplemental resource, I'm using it to solidify a concept or to clarify a concept. So if I don't understand something from lecture, that's when I go to my supplemental resources to find something that makes more sense to me. Um, another one that I forgot to talk about, it's a fan favorite. It's a YouTube channel, Ninja Nerd Science. Fantastic. His videos are a little longer, but he does it in such a way that once you're done with that video, you know exactly what he was just talking about. It's fantastic. Um, but again, everything with a grain of salt, what works for me might not work for you. So please try these out. Please do free trials on these things. See if you like it. Click through some of Ninja Nerd Science videos and see if you like him. Armando Hasudanon is another really good one that I like on YouTube. He, his is, um, he draws it out, but it's a time lapse. It's, they're fantastic. Like there's a concept in term two and B that I only understood because of Armando Hasudanon's lectures. He was incredible. Um, and Dr. Dr. Najib is good too, but that ninja nerd guy, he's brilliant. So yeah, yeah, check him out. But I just want to reiterate, if you use external resources, stay in, stay in the scope of the course, right? Yeah. It should only be to answer or expand upon uh, a concept yeah. from lecture. You don't want to just dive down this rabbit hole and you're ending up doing a lot of pathology in term four that you're not going to be tested on. Also, I know some people are just gung ho about starting UWorld questions. I don't know if y'all are aware of how, how the curriculum works at SGU. Year one, you go through what's normal, right? You have to know, you have to understand what's normal to understand what's abnormal. Then year two, you go through pathology based. All of the questions in UWorld for the most part are pathology based. You're worried about that you were about patients coming in that are sick, not normal. Yeah. So the point is year yeah. one, those questions are out of the scope of what you're doing. Yeah. So don't stress it. Um, uh, but year two, you'll go through pathology, you go through all the abnormalities, and then it's yeah. more important to do um, to do those. So Can building I also on- hop in? Oh. One, one yeah, more thing my... I wanted to say, um, when you guys are going through the slides, right, they're going to give it to you in terms of material that is appropriate for your level. Like all, all three of us have said this, it's at your level. The thing is, whenever you touch an external resource, you always run the risk of either overlearning or underlearning yes. a material of any kind. And I often did this, like I went for CPR, I was like, okay, I have no idea what the heck is happening with the physiology component of it. I'm going to watch a Boards and Beyond video. Two days later, they covered it in lecture at the right level that I needed to, but I had already learned it based off of like a disorder, like COPD, and it made no sense to me at that given time. So it's very, very crucial that you stick to the slides and then you base any external resource with that grain of salt that you might either be overlearning or underlearning any of it. So yeah. um, building on top of what Brady and Kishore just said, um, the SGU curriculum, you take three passes through the information. The first pass is the entirety of year one, and it's very foundational. 
It's normal. All it is doing is setting the building blocks. So if you don't completely understand that something in year one, don't beat yourself up over it because you have two more passes through the information. Now, the second pass through the information is um, term four and then the first um, module of term five. Year um, Term three, I like to say it's a bridging term between year one and year two because it's a lot of information you need for clinical medicine, but they just fold in the concepts into everything in year two. So term three, I just call a bridging term. So the second pass through the information is term four and the first um, module in term five, that's, that's um, the pathology, which is when you can start using those question banks. Then the third pass through the information, which is the majority of term five, you're doing, you're getting, now you're incorporating everything. You're doing the pathophysiology. You're getting more into everything and you're applying it more to um, clinical medicine and the different specialties. So, uh, you know, doing that. So I've really come to respect the curriculum at SGU because they really do keep folding it in and folding it in and folding it in. So by the time you're getting ready to study for step, it's not like you've forgotten what you did in term one, because it's incorporated throughout the entire time you're at SGU. So keep that in the back of your mind when you're going through this, that there is a method to the madness. There is a reason why they curated the curriculum, why they, how they did trust the process and focus on what's in front of you right now, because if you do, it'll work. Like there, there's no reason why you can't be successful. If you utilize the resources, you trust the process. Sometimes it does get frustrating. We're not going to lie to you. Sometimes in FTM, you're going to be like, okay, this makes absolutely no sense. This isn't organized. And it's going to feel like that because it is very foundational. They're just giving you a bunch of these concepts, accept it, move on. We've all had those thoughts before. Everyone behind you is going to have those same thoughts, but remember, trust the process. There's a reason why it's set up this way. They're going to keep folding all of these concepts back into every pass through the curriculum. Um, but yeah, focus on what's in front of you. Like you'll talk about cystic fibrosis in like 10, 10 different times, right? So each time you're going to learn a little bit more or whatever, yeah. Marfan syndrome or oste you know, osteoporosis, whatever. It doesn't matter. The point is just learn what you need to know. At the end of the day, all of the test questions come from the lectures. They can literally, they literally mark them. They have codes that come. They could say this test question came from this slide of this lecture. So when in doubt, fall back on the lectures. All right. Who's next? I was long-winded. We apologize. <laughs> Nikita. No, thank you. Thank you for your, your responses. I appreciate it. It was helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, well, hi guys. Thank you so much, first of all, for doing it. Um, my just question is quite generic. So earlier, Brady was showing his layout for the schedule and how he plans out. So he mentioned that he doesn't really focus much on Anki. So if you don't mind sharing, what do you exactly do for active recall? So after you've gone through your DLAs and you have uh, watched the lectures, what do you exactly do for active recalling? So things that the concepts are going in your head, kind of like... Right. So my my highlighting system is very regimented in that like uh, buzzwords are in red or stuff that like I need to burn in my brain are in red. Green's like a definition and yellow's kind of like supplemental um, or, you know, explanatory. That's what I do. So when I go back through, I you know, it's almost like flashcards. They're just in red in my notes. Right. And then um, so and then this is how I work out, like when I write those notes out. Um, so let's say the, so your courses will be three weeks, right? So the three days prior to the exam, I dedicate one day to a, an entire week. And I write out my abbreviated notes. Um, I find when you write things out, like especially closer to the exam, you tend to memorize them or you tend to remember them. And then I have those short, those shorthand notes that I can look at, you know, the night before the morning of and stuff. So if, there's, if the exam is three weeks long, three days prior, um, each day, each day is dedicated to a week. I'll write everything up again. It'll be my last pass through the actual notes. And then I'll have my shorthand notes. But at the end of the day, the best way, even if you have to teach yourself in the mirror, the best way to see how well you know the material is explain it to somebody. I find out very quickly where my deficiencies are when I start talking about it. I'm like, nope, I don't know what I'm talking about. So that's kind of how it works. If you can get to that point um, where you can talk through it with people, um, that's mm -hmm. the best way to go about it, yeah. 
it is the absolute best way to test your active recall into practice active recall, honestly. All right, thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Yep. Okay, Libby. Hi, I'm Sienna. Um, my question is related to like the extracurriculars, the clubs. Um, I like really enjoy working with my hands. I scribed in the ER for two years. So oh, so I'm, did I. Yay. Yeah, hi. Um, so I was thinking of joining like the um, emergency medicine club or surgical club or, or like maybe one of the two. Um, how much time do those take up? Do you recommend it? Do you think it's beneficial? Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I knew I wanted to get involved um, as soon as possible. There are those that say you should wait a term or so. I am not of that mindset simply because I think if you want to get involved, you need to learn how to get involved and incorporate that into your academic schedule. And you don't want to get comfortable in your academic schedule in term one and then have up in term two because you got involved. That's my personal opinion. Um, it might work for you. It might not. Um, both Brady and I are highly involved, him and IEA, me and SGA. Um, I will say, though, that the skills clinics that the organizations put on, they're not closed to just members. I went to an intubation clinic with the EMC um, and I wasn't a member. You just sign up. Now, members do get priority to sign up for those events, but it's not like you're not going to be able to go. Um, so uh, for SGA, we have general body meetings every other week. I don't know how often other organizations have general body meetings. Um, it is at least going to be once a month, um, maybe twice a month. So your actual, um, your actual time dedication is probably going to be a few hours every month for general body meetings. And then if you want to get involved more heavily, like for example, in SGA, we have a bunch of committees. And so if you want to get more involved in SGA and you want to dedicate more time, you can join committees. Um, I don't, I'm not sure the structure of other organizations, but it might be the same way, but there are opportunities to just be a member or to take a more active role, a more leadership role in that club. But you can always reach out to them reach out to their executive board, reach out to their president and say, hey, I'm really in, uh, interested, I'm, but, but I want to make sure that I can fit this into my schedule. Again, live and die by your calendar. Honestly, put everything in there because you need to make sure that you are giving yourself enough time to do everything that you are um, responsible for and expected to do. But it's a really good opportunity to make friends, make connections, really get involved. I, I highly recommend it for anybody that's interested. Um, if you're on the fence, I say go for it. You can always kind of opt out if you feel like you need to yeah, focus that's the thing. more on academics. Yeah. Yeah, you could always, yeah. But like surgery club, we met like, I don't know, a couple of times a term we offered um, suture clinics, which is cool. You could do that. Um, I'm not sure about emergency medicine, but I'm sure it's the same. You know, there's no really hard, you know, unless you're on the executive board, there's no, um, you know, like true obligation. Um, it's more just for you to interact with people. So yeah, I'd say go for it. Okay. Thank you so much for the advice. I wasn't sure how big of a commitment that was. Yeah. Allison. Hi, um, I just have two quick clarification questions. Uh, the first one being, so for the DLA objectives, y'all said don't focus on that, then what specifically are we focusing on when we study the DLAs? And then the second the question is uh, just the slides. Yeah, just yeah, the slides. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the oh, DLAs thought, are just, oh, go ahead. They're lectures. They're just done on your own, honestly. Because I thought the objectives, like, the, the answers to the objective questions are directly in the slide. So I thought that was what the emphasis was. Yeah, I mean, kind of, but like you'll find that some of the objectives are so broad that it's like, it is the lecture. Like, oh, I okay. think, yeah, I mean, like some people are systematic and they like to just do it. But I, I, I think like going through the lecture kind of outlines the whole story yeah. for you. You know, like, because so you can kind of see from small to big what's going on. And if you're just doing it in a question based format, um, you, you know, you might lose the whole connection that's going through it. Yeah, I, neither Brady and I look at objectives at all. Um, we just focus on the lecture slides. And if you 
understand the concepts being taught in the lecture, then it you should be able to answer the objectives. Like if you want to go through after you've studied and just look at the objectives and see if you understand it, you can do that. But I don't look at the objectives at all simply because, um, I mean, there's really no need to, honestly, you're understanding the concepts, you have practice questions, and you might miss something if you're just trying to answer the objectives. Okay. Honestly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then uh, just real quick, if I got placed in the wrong time zone for tomorrow, um, do I only need to email like School of Medicine BPM1 or do I, is there a faculty? DOS. DOS. Dean of students. They're going to be the ones that are going to make that change and they will inform your course director of that change. Oh, okay. Cause I emailed Dr. Forrester, but I know he takes, he's probably like flooded with emails right now. So. Yeah. Oh, that's another thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, once you guys have SGA representatives, you can go to them with anything and everything that you need. Um, if it is course specific, it's the BPM1 at, S at whatever it is, BPM1 SOM at sgu.edu. I think that's the email. Um, for anything course specific, that's there. If it's policy related, that's Dean of Basic Sciences and or Dean of Students. Any accommodation thing is going to be Dean of Students. So you cannot email your course director for an exemption or a, an accommodation. They cannot give it to you. It is at the level of DOS and they are the ones to approve or deny accommodation and they will let the course director know. Um, but something um, I encourage you guys to do if you have an issue, reach out to your SGA reps. Don't try to tag anybody and everybody in an email. That's called spamming. If you just look at a list and you're like, okay, I need a question answer. So I'm going to do the, I'm going to do DOS. I'm going to do Dean of Basic Sciences. I'm going to do this person, this person, this person, this person. That's called spamming. Um, don't do that because if you reach out to an SGA rep, they probably know who you have to talk to. Like if you texted me with an issue, I know exactly the person you need to talk to. So make sure you are utilizing your SGA reps. Make sure you are utilizing upper term students because um, how do you know your, who your SGA reps are? You don't have them right now because we haven't elected them. Um, about two weeks after your first day, um, we will release that list to you. We are going to probably release it via email not we'll we'll put it on social media we'll post it on the portal but we will email it to you um and that'll have your representatives that'll have your class coordinators and that'll have everything you need sga wise but they're going to be your go-to for any issue um but if you guys have any questions don't hesitate to ask me like i you know i've been doing this for you know five terms now so um you know i can help you get to where you need to be and if i don't know the answer to the question i'm going to ask and i'm going to get it for you um so yeah, so right now, attend, oh, I'm going to answer a question for you guys that you are going to have, so I'm anticipating it. The 80% rule for lectures, it's not an attendance policy. I, I really want you guys to understand this. This is not an attendance policy. It is a participation policy. And the expectation is that you are present for 100% of all scheduled sessions. Now, you have a 20% grace. What that means is they understand that there are things in your life that are going to prevent you from going to lecture, lab, anything. And you get a 20% grace before that affects your grade. And the reason they, and if you drop down below, it's a professionalism thing. So if you drop down below 80%, you're going to get um, professionalism points taken away, check out your syllabus, check out your learning strategies pathway or learning, whatever that document is called. It will tell you, it'll outline it for you, but there are no excused absences because it's not attendance, it's participation. So if you have to leave for a, um, like if you're sick one week or there's something in the family make sure you are reaching out to dean of students not your course director remember they can't do accommodations dean of students they will not get 
they, they will always tell you this is included in your 20%. They're always going to say that because there is no excused attendance, excused absences. But what it will do, if you have issues that come up during the term and you communicate those issues, if you drop below that 80%, you can show, hey, I was communicating to you through the whole term. You know, some of these things were out of my control and that can help you when determining if you're going to get a grade penalty. Now, I'm gonna reiterate this because I know you're gonna ask, they do not give excused absences. Absolutely not. They're always going to tell you it falls under the 20%. And I know I'm beating a dead horse, but I know you're going to ask it. And we're going to say the same things over and over and over again. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. Death in a family, you need to go home for a funeral. You get really sick for a week or two. Your internet goes out and you can't access anything. All of this falls under the 20%. But all of this should be communicated to Dean of Students so that if you do fall under the 80%, you've communicated it. So I wanna get that out because I know everybody asks it. Everybody always asks, asks it. So I've clearly explained it to you and hopefully you understand. <laughs> My advice simply is uh, try not to ride that 80% line. No. Um, go towards, you know, and then if it's closer to the exam and you happen to need to miss some stuff, at least you're over the 80%, but Try not to make it too close, right? You don't want to get, get in that uh, in that mindset. All right, any other questions? Um, Obviously, if anything comes up uh, in the next whatever or whenever, you could just message us. I, we do our best to get back as soon, soon yeah. as we can. Yeah, what's up? Okay, I'm just trying to understand um, what is exactly a flipped class? I see that on my schedule. Um, so a flipped classroom, the idea is that you are learning the information beforehand and the actual scheduled session is more interactive. Um, the actual execution of the session is going to be dependent on the lecturer. So however they want to make that session interactive. But the premise is that um, they are, um, they're trying to get you to learn the information through questions or talking or something along those lines. Okay, so it's like a discussion class with all of the cohorts. Yeah, again, it's kind of up to the, to the discretion of that particular professor of how they want to do it. Um, so it, but the main thing is you need to look at the lectures beforehand. That's the biggest thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Can I just ask a question real quick? <laughs> So I had asked earlier about the DLA. So you guys look at the learning objectives, but not you don't like directly answer them. We don't even look even, at them. I don't even look at them. I just you go guys through the watch lectures. Those videos then that come with the DLAs. Yes. Uh, no comment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I look at the videos that come with the. Yeah, DLAs. watch the videos. You should watch I the videos. Guys look at that little lecture thing that they give you, which is it looks similar to the lecture one, but like. Yeah. On Pan it's all on Pan 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 but also yeah. in the DLA, they I saw that they included like one or two slides that I couldn't find in the lecture video or the DLA video. So like sometimes they do that. It's still important yeah. though. Yeah, right? it's yeah. if it's in the PDF, it's testable. But if it's not in the it wasn't in our PDFs. That's what I'm saying. But he still had his own slide. Mm, you, have to to resources. Some, you have to go to resources. You have to go to resources. Yeah, the, the, they might pose an errata and they might fix any of the DLA content. Um, just be aware of that. So make sure you download the latest version and the potential errors and things that they've corrected. And something to keep in mind, the DLAs, uh, the associated videos are sometimes not always up to date and they might not always sync up all the time. So just be aware, whatever that is missing, they will address it. You just have to be a little bit patient with them when they do upload that. And that is definitely something when you do have SGA reps that they can advocate for. Yeah, sometimes those erratas are a pain, but you need to go back and fix your lecture notes. If there's something written incorrectly, they'll post the correct version. You need to make sure you have it correct in your notes, okay? It's a, it, it's a pain. We all have to do it, so. Yeah. <clears throat> 
But seriously, I mean, if you want to do the lecture objectives, like you're all for yeah, it. Go but, for it. We're not saying don't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just no, nobody I know does it. So you can take yeah. that. <laughs> it's, it's Again, just, we've said this so many times. What works for you is the yeah. best, is the best way. So, I mean, if, if you leave this session today and nothing Brady and I have said works and you figure out a, a way that works for you, absolutely perfect. We are so happy for you. Um, it's really what's going to be best for you. Again, um, DES can help you, the learning strategists. Um, don't hesitate to use the resources. Like, you are a medical student. You are trying to be successful. Utilize, use and abuse the resources that are here for you. I mean, you're paying for it. You might as well get as much out of it as you can, right? So reach out, meet them halfway. Um, I'm going to go on a little TED talk for about 60 seconds. It is going to be all about your mindset, all about your attitude. Nobody at SGU is going to spoon feed you your success. You have to make it on your own. Now, Brady and I are here to help you guys. But, you know, again, you have to sign up for the review. You have to click into our Zoom link and you have to come and you have to pay attention. And you have to utilize it. But we are here for you, right? SGU does the exact same thing. SGU has so many resources for you. But if you don't sit back, if you sit back and you don't use them, you got, you got to take the initiative. You got to meet SGU halfway. You got to meet us halfway. You got to meet everybody halfway. And you have to make your own success because, um, medical school is hard. It's doable, but it's hard. And so make sure that you are going into it with a very good mindset and knowing that if you see a deficit, if you see somewhere where you are lacking, you're reaching out and you're asking questions and you are getting what you need to succeed. So if you utilize the resources, there's no reason you can't be successful. I just had a question. Somebody was asking about my highlight method, right? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll say it a little slower. Um, so when I go into class, I highlight stuff that's important. I do red, red is usually uh, keywords. I don't know if there's cancer. It's like tumor markers that are identi you know, identify the certain cancer, uh, certain parameters that are very important that I want to burn into my brain. Green is usually like definitions or like uh, uh, symptoms or stuff like that. And yellow is just kind of supplemental. It's just so I can organize it when I go back through. Now, on that 48 hour cycle, when I go back through my lecture notes, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of fix them a little bit, right? Because it's kind of hard during lecture accordingly. So that's just how I do it. And it helps me when I go back through to see like what the teacher found important, what I found important at the time. Um, but um, yeah, so that's how that works. Um, I think that's it. We have to do a term to one of these in about 20 minutes. So if you have any other questions, oh, I have. Know. I have one more point that I want to reiterate before. Um, during lecture, make sure that you aren't trying to like take notes in the lecture. Like a lot of people like in undergrad, I would have a spiral notebook and I would take notes while the professor was talking. You do not have time for that. Um, I always just uh, highlight what is emphasized and make extra notes that the professor is talking about or emphasizing. Um, just pay attention, listen to what they're emphasizing. And then when you go back and do your post read, that's when you really get into the information and you're trying to actively recall, you're trying to master the information. And if you want to make your own notes, that is the time to do so, so that you can really organize it in the way you see is best. Yeah. Just annotate the slides on your yeah. iPad, or if you want to print it out, do that. Um, that's the easiest way. But again, this is a learning process. Uh, yes. Med school is learning how you learn. So everybody's yeah. different. Um, anyway, well, good. It was nice to meet everybody. Yeah. Um, if y'all have any issues, yes, yes. Can I ask you guys one question? Um, sure. How do you guys have like time to even do this? Ah, like what? It's, it's spiraled out of control <laughs> over the years is what happened. And <laughs> Oh my God, it really did. Are, it really did. Yeah, we do. We do at least one review for every term for every single test. Yeah. So uh, some of our reviews, because we used to split them up and do two reviews per test because they're so long. But now we have so many of these that we do usually one that runs about three and a half or four hours where we go through everything you need to know for the exam. Right. Um, I mean, ideally, it helps us too. Yes. Amen. It yes. helps us yes. too, right? So yeah. we're doing this out of the kindness of our hearts, but I mean, we get something out of it too, because when we're preparing beer. your slides, also, 
also for beer. If you see me <laughs> at the bar, I will take a free beer. Um, yes, but no, seriously, yeah, it actually does help us out a lot. Um, you know, like term four was my best term and it's just because I had such a good foundation uh, in term one and term two doing these. So um, yeah, uh, but no, I mean, yeah, we, you, you'll find the time to and uh, when it's time for you guys to teach, um, y'all will Calendar. enjoy it and y'all will get, yeah, y'all will get a lot I out of it too. I live and die by my Google Calendar. And so when we're doing a review session, I put it in my calendar. So I know I, I'm serious. You need to have a Google Calendar and I said, not a calendar. It doesn't have to be Google, but I do suggest it is a computer calendar, a phone calendar or whatever, because if you try to write down everything and you have to switch everything up, it'll get really tedious. And you, and I also like that it reminds me. So, you know, 30 minutes before I get a little notification, it's like, oh, hey, Lindsay, you have lecture. Oh, hey, Lindsay, remember about this? So if it's on my calendar, it literally does not happen. And look, if y'all have time, go look at the FTM1 review, just the, the beginning of it and see what the first week is about, probably 30, 45 minutes. So y'all could see kind of like uh, how we approach the stuff. So you kind of go into that first week, which is hell week, uh, like, like the army does, uh, they put you through the ringer just to make sure. But um, you will survive. Not... Yeah, yeah. Lean but on it's... each other. We're serious. Lean on each other, form those groups. If you're studying online, you will have to take a little more initiative to form those connections. But everyone in your class is doing the exact same thing as you. They're going through the exact same thing as you. Brady made a comment earlier that, you know, his family, You there are people in your life that are not going to understand your study schedule. There are people in your life that aren't going to get it and that's fine, but you need to find the people in your class who do to lean on each other, to support one another, form study groups, do silent study on Zoom. If you're in person, go study somewhere, quiz each other, um, but try to make those connections. Yes, there was a, a question, the FTM review, Lindsay and I had done F this FTM, what you're about to go through a couple of times now. So. We taught it to the January class was prior to you. So if you go in the about section on the scrubs page, there is a link to YouTube. That's the only way you can get there because it's private. Bookmark that. It'll bring you there. Find the FTM one. Go take a look at it. I promise you won't be disappointed. All right. We got to go. If you have any other issues, um, y'all can message us. Good luck. Yeah. That will be fine. Good luck. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah congrats, you're going to do guys. great. You're going to do great. Remember the big picture, right? Remember what you're doing this for. It's a good cause. You're going to do big, great things. So uh, we all will. Oh, my all God, right? Shay. I love your joke in the chat. <laughs> Is there <laughs> all panic and no disco, Kish? Yeah. Is there a point when the panic? <laughs> I'm going to, like, simmer on that for a while. That was that was really good. All right, guys. We're going to close the, the meeting. Just message us if y'all need anything. Um, Good luck.